Today we're talking about restoring the soul of America. The idea of a nation having a soul, like a person has a soul, is kind of an interesting idea, isn't it? I mean, we think of people all the time that they are souls, right? But we don't often think about a nation has a soul. But any community of people, in a way, you could say has a culture. Every group of people has something that motivates them, something that drives them, something that they put at the heart of who they are and their identity. A lot of times communities have a spirit, don't they? Hopefully we have a loving, gracious, compassionate, full of love, laughter, life, spirit here at Life Springs. That's what we want to grow and nurture. We want a kind of spirit and culture that really brings blessing and freedom and hope to people. But the idea of a nation having a soul, I think, is a really interesting idea when we think about sin came into the world. The essence of sin was man as God. But God created man to be in community. He created us to be in families and in cities and towns and nations. And what happens is that sin, being man as God, its fullness is the state as God, or tyranny, total oppression that makes life miserable for humanity. It's the very antithesis of the rule and reign of Jesus Christ. It's the antithesis of the kingdom of God on earth. It's the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of bondage. It's the very thing that Jesus came to deliver us from. And this idea really needs to get into our heart. He didn't just come to save us from our sin. He came to save us from all the implications of our sin. He didn't just come to save us as individuals. He came to save us as a community. We're not isolated individuals. That idea needs to get into the heart and minds of believers in a very radical way once again. He didn't just come to save me from my sin. He came to save us from our sin. He came to deliver us from evil. He came to cause love to reign on earth. Those ideas, I love that I can say them freely in our church, but they're challenging ideas for a lot of Christians. They really are. Because we tend to feel safe and comfortable and secure when we hear things that agree with our values. One of the most interesting things to me is that Christianity or religion in general often can become something very stagnant. It's almost like we're afraid to wrestle with ideas and to change and to grow. We're afraid to hear something other than what we believe already And if we hear something that's contrary to what we believe already, the the easiest thing to do is to break fellowship. But I think it's symptomatic that we it, it proves that we've been creating a machine rather than an organism. That we have pandered to conformity rather than developed the image of God and man. The fact that you can see these symptoms in the church means that we have been building from the wrong kingdom. Without realizing it, the operating system is a world operating system when we can't disagree. When we have to break fellowship because we disagree on minors, but we do have to hold to the majors. We're created in the image of God. We fell into sin. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son to die for our sin. He rose again ascended into heaven, and is coming back to judge the living and the dead. The essentials we agree on. The particulars, we have a lot of room for people to grow as they're walking with Jesus and following Jesus, and that's healthy. But this whole idea of a soul is pretty interesting to me. 
Because we read about scripture. What is the value of your soul? What is the value of a national soul? What is the idea of a soul? It makes me think also about repentance. What is repentance? The reason I put that after there is because there's an obtuse line of thinking here. But a lot of times when we deal with the scriptures that talk about the soul, which we're going to read here in a minute, what will a man give in exchange for his soul, we tend to often in the church of Jesus Christ default to a radical legalism and a beating people over the head and motivating people by fear. Does that make sense? How, how do I say it? You know, what will it profit if you, if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? I mean, I'm exaggerating it, but you know that I, what I'm talking about is common in the church of Jesus Christ. I, as a matter, I don't want to, how is it going to say this? But like something appeared at the church. Let's just put it this way. And I thought, I thought I'm going to open this thing up and see what spirit is it of. It's Christian. And they love Jesus. And I thought about it. And I'm like, man, these people really love Jesus. But the level of driving people from that motivation was just all over this thing that was left at our church. And I thought, huh, until the church gets this right, we are operating from the wrong kingdom. It really is the kingdom of this world and how this world is run. So that's why I got from the idea of the soul to the idea of repentance, because we do the same thing. You need to repent. You need to repent. And that word has become like a four-letter word in our culture. And to be quite honest, it is a hard word to understand, isn't it? It doesn't have any language communication to our culture anymore. Does that make sense? The only thing it communicates generally is our brand of Christianity. Does that make sense? Really, that's all it communicates because the word is archaic in today's language. But, but it's, it's become so much a part of Christianity. You need to repent. You need to repent, brother. I'm, I, because I love you, I'm coming to you to let you know you need to repent. But even the way I do that, it's like I'm putting you down. You do, I'm putting myself over you. There's something just not healthy about it. But when you think about the idea of repent means to turn around and go a different direction, now it makes a little more sense, doesn't it? And then you can take these ideas and try to communicate it in language that people can understand that makes sense. You need to repent. Well, why? What's the motivation for even that language? You're headed for a way that is destroying your life. You're heading down a path that is hurting you and hurting others, and you need to turn around and go home. It's the prodigal son. You've lived in a world, and now you're so broken that you're jealous of the pigs. Go home to your father's house. It's go away from the things that bring death and turn and go towards the things that bring life. Those ideas communicate, don't they? Those ideas communicate in the modern world, but the word repent doesn't. The substance of it, the idea of it, what it really means totally communicates. But the word doesn't communicate anymore. But it's in the word, brother. It's a translation. But we have to understand the ideas and the principles. The idea is to communicate life to the world and turn them from darkness to the light. Turn them from heading down a road that is ruining lives, their own life, right? I'm trying to lay a foundation for, you know, to, for this message. And hopefully the foundation doesn't end up ruining the message. It can happen because it could go too long. But I wanted to talk about why we talk about ideas so much at our church. You know, it's actually not that exciting. The world often wants to be told what to do so I can go and execute. Tell me what to do so I can go and execute. Make it so dumb for me that I don't have to think for myself. Ow. Do you see what I'm saying? Make it simple for me so I know what to do so I can feel good about my Christianity. The problem is that God does not want robots. 
He wants us to know him and understand him. And there's something about people having a revelation for themselves, developing a worldview for themselves, believing in it, being fully convinced that changes everything. And so it's more, the way I liken it, it's gardening. You're, you're starting to wrestle with ideas and you think, oh man, this is hurting my head. I'm wrestling with ideas and I don't even see the practical point. Well, the reason why is the ideas that we have about who God is. What is he like? What is, the, what is man? What is the purpose of man on this world? These ideas that we wrestle with, they start to change us from the inside out. They start to change how we operate and how we interact and how we relate to one another. But it's not, it's, it's like watching grass grow or a tree grow or a flower grow. You don't even know it's making a difference. But then it does, over time, makes a difference. I mean, I was laughing because I walk through all the time with Stephanie. She likes to watch YouTube. And she was, you know, I heard Leah, she's up in the media room, and Rachel's, I think, in the back. But I guess, like, one of the people who is a big name started speaking really negatively about therapists. And so we know Jordan Peterson's a therapist, and... They ended up getting on, you know, I guess YouTube or the internet, whatever they do, podcast, video cast, whatever it is, uh, tells you that I need to spend more time on the internet. Um, but I walked through and I saw part of it. It was so interesting to me. And Jordan Peterson was talking to this guy in powerful ways, trying to get him to understand. Because it was really this whole idea. You just need to tell people what they need to do. And, and Jordan was like, okay, let me tell you how, what therapists have actually discovered. What's that? First, when you just tell somebody what to do, they're offended often by you because, he, he didn't say this, but you basically misuse the image of God and man. They're resentful. You've put yourself over them in a way that they often have a negative response. Sometimes you, you tell them what to do, but they just don't do it. They didn't listen to you. Tell you what, I told you so is never, I told you so is way too late. And nothing good ever comes from it. Does that make sense? And so, he, but he said, but let's say you come to me and you're struggling with something in your, in, at your workplace and I tell you what to do and you go and do it and it succeeds. I've robbed you of your victory. That was my victory, not your victory. But if I can help you wrestle with the ideas, wrestle with your values and you come to a solution for yourself and you execute it, now it's your victory. Isn't that an interesting perspective? It seems like uh, subtle. It isn't subtle. It's about creating human beings that are truly free and responsible and reflect the image of God on earth rather than robots. Isn't that interesting? And so whenever the church tries to create that dependence in people, they're creating something that looks very different than a human being or a Christian. And yet that operating system is often very much in the church. You know, we, we, we often understand, like, you know, everybody wants the government to take care of every, any, everything, the nanny state. Well, if we're not developing mature human beings, why should we think that we can overcome that trajectory in the world? Just some ideas to throw out there, right? And then here's another ch very challenging one before we start to really get into the message. Why do we talk about America so much here at Life Springs Church? And I would suggest that America is a very important nation in redemption history. That's a, that's a challenging idea, isn't it? And this might end up in a part two or part three, because <laughs> I can already feel it happening. But America, I will argue, is a very important nation in redemption history. So now I just want to examine a scripture that kind of, you know, ties together some of the things that we just started with. Zechariah 1.3, Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, 
return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you. I mean, that, that idea is very simple, isn't it? God says, return to me, and I will return to you. But the picture then is these are people are separated from God, isn't it? They are separated from God. And he says, return to me, and I will return to you. It's that picture of repentance, isn't it? Come back to the Father's house. Come back to where there's life. The reason I want to wrestle with that scripture, though, is who's it written to? Most people say, the Jews. Correct. And what often happens when we read scripture is we say, oh, that was written to the Jews. It's not for us. That was written for Jews, not for us. Notice it wasn't written for an individual. It was written for a nation. It was written for a people. This is the idea I want to keep pulling out. You return to me. It's not a personal salvation message. It was a national message. Return to me and I will return to you. But the question when you think of it as a national message, is it also a national message for every nation on the earth? That's where people, that's really super challenging, isn't it? Right? Now, if I will, now, and I understand, like, you can get caught up in the tenses of the tenses of things. What do you mean? Return to me. Well, we were never with you in the first place, so we can't return to you because we never were with you in the ever. So, what? How about come to me, and I will come to you. Now, does the idea speak? Does that make sense? If you will come to me, I will make my habitation with you. Oh, now that really starts to make sense. It sounds like revelation, doesn't it? Not, per, But it's not just personal. This is an invitation to nations, communities. And if we can start to think that God actually has a desire to be present in nations, that's an idea that if we will accept it, starts to change a lot in our lives without us even realizing it. We Rabbi Sachs talked about the Old Testament is that it is a system. I, I'm not going to use a word. Law would be, yeah, I'll call it the law, the law of God. That's what we can call it. And, and I'll read some things from him later that will actually bring this up. But he said that the purpose of the law is to build a community or a nation or a society however you want to say it, that is a home for the divine presence. Well, that captures the imagination now, doesn't it? He wants to create a world that is a home for his presence so that he can dwell with us and be in our midst. That the very things that you read about in the Old Testament, there's no other nation on the earth at the time that God dwells with. God literally dwelt in the midst of Israel. Balaam saw it. It was amazing. A cloud by day, a pillar by night, fed manna, water from a rock. God was with them. In their history and all the intricate details, God was with them. But they were meant to be a first fruits among nations. That is an idea that will have radical ramifications and plays into this idea of America being an important nation in redemption history. So the substance of a soul. You can't talk about restoring the soul of a nation without talking about the substance of a soul a little bit. So Matthew 16, 24 through 26. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And, and, and there's a lot there, but for time and to keep things in track, just want to talk about this idea, what does it profit a man 
if he gains the whole world and loses his soul. Now, we often in the church use that scripture to talk about eternal life and, and life after death and eternal judgment, don't we? But and, and it was, Chuck was talking with me about this this week, and he's like, I think it has to do with this life as well. Yes, it has to do with this life as well. The very thing at the beginning also, you know, whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And yes, we can talk about in eternity, but when these principles of the greatest measure of success is imitating Jesus, for brevity's sake, self-sacrifice, love, lifting people up, being a blessing rather than using people. It creates a world of human flourishing, a world that reflects heaven, a world that experiences the goodness of God in the land of the living. But when people stray from the way God designed it, people experience the opposite. They lose their soul. The passage in Luke really, you know, I think somewhat brings that out, although you can always take it about eternal realities. But he says, she shows a picture of a person who is really prospering. Man, I'm prospering with great abundance. That was God's heart to prosper you. He did it. It was all from him. What are you going to do? I don't have enough barns to store all this. I'm going to tear them down and build bigger barns and store it all. He's got all this prosperity being showered on him. And what does he do? He spends his whole life trying to store it up so that he can live on it forever. And it says your life is required of you or it's asked of you right now. And it's a tragic picture of a person who never lived well. It's a tragic picture of a person who was radically prospered but couldn't live well because he was missing the point. He wasn't rich towards God, which is also rich towards men. He didn't enjoy the fruits of the blessing, of the prosperity, in community, in fellowship, in celebration, in thanksgiving, in enjoying each other's company. Super interesting, isn't it? And and so when you think about these things, not just from an eternal perspective, but about how then shall we live, it changes a whole lot. It has the potential to cause heaven and earth to reflect one another. To be, or, or earth to reflect heaven, I guess should say, heaven will never reflect earth, but earth can reflect heaven. To, when people are rich towards God, but the better way to say it is they are walking in love and in community and fellowship and putting first things first. People, people matter. What do people really crave? Connection, fellowship. And, and, we, and, and we were talking a long time. We spent a long time. And someday we're going to pack some of these ideas. But the world really, the, the, the problems of this world are so interconnected with the loss of our soul. What do you mean? I start, people become a commodity. And, I, and now I have a capital firm that buys companies, turns them around to make a profit. and doesn't matter who they sacrifice in the end. And in while losing my soul, I don't know why I'm miserable and turning to cocaine and prostitutes because I have sold my soul. I have lost my soul. I've lost my way. I've lost what it means to truly live and to live well and to flourish. My soul does not rejoice in using people for my own selfish ends. My soul rejoices and flourishes when I serve, when I love, when I connect. And then, and then we see all kinds, then I can't stand this world we're living in. I mean, there's so many interconnected issues with losing our soul. People are all, and we often don't put the ax to the root of the problem. We got drug dealers coming into America. We got human trafficking coming into America. Well, guess what? They wouldn't be coming if there wasn't a market. Why is there a market? Because we've lost our soul. We can't deal with these problems until we restore the soul of America. These pro- it don't matter how many walls you build and if you put automatic weaponry, and I mean, it doesn't matter what you try to do. 
the market will find a way. We've got to rescue our soul, and it's all interconnected. What do you mean? Well, let's just tell them that they're bad for using drugs and for human trafficking. Well, what, 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 what? you got to keep going down to deeper into the root. Where have we lost our way? Because a lot of times people are turning to drugs and to, to sin because to self-medicate because they lost their way much farther up the road than that. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. I started living for power, for wealth, for prestige. I start, I, I, we lost our way long before the symptoms of people giving themselves to drugs and sexual immorality. People are often doing that to try to numb the pain of having lost their soul. So we've got to go much deeper than that. But I want to give you a vision, or at least part of a vision, of what is possible in a nation, or what, what a nation is like that God wants to build. How should I put that? If we, if we go back to that idea that the law is meant to create a world that is a home for the divine presence that reflects heaven's rule on earth. I'm, I, obviously, it's the whole word of God, the whole law, but so I'm only going to be reading a small portion of it to help get this idea ingrained into our own hearts and minds. Deuteronomy 4, 7 through 9. For what great nation is there that, God, that has God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us? For whatever reason we may call upon him. And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in this law which I set before you today? Only take heed to yourselves and diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life, and teach them to your children and grandchildren. The picture is, what other nation has God so near to it? You've been given these statutes and decrees that have created a home for the divine presence. But be diligent to pass this heritage or inheritance on to your children. Because they could lose it. They could lose their way. Isn't it an interesting picture? But it puts God dwelling with man at the heart of it. You know, I think that's so neat. Now often in the church of Jesus Christ, when they look at the law in the Old Testament... They say, well, that's just a special dispensation for the Jews, not a model of what God wants to do on earth. But that isn't the Western heritage. It's not the heritage that brought forth America. It was Christians who actually believed that God wanted to create a world that's a home for his divine presence that brought forth America. Now, there's so many layers of Christian thinking that we need to really rethink because we've been trained, law bad, gospel good, law anger, gospel love, I mean, I could just go on for a long time there, but you could fill in the blanks, right? Law, bad. Don't be, don't preach law. Don't preach law. You're not a faithful Christian. You need to flee a church that preaches law. You see, you, you, I'm, I'm being silly a little bit, but I've seen this stuff personally. I have literally had people say, I cannot work with you in Christianity because of the difference of a group. They won't even be willing to have a conversation about it. Aren't even willing to imagine it. It's so, it's so anathema. This is the time of the Gentiles. And when it's wrapped up, then God's going to continue what he started with the church, Jews. Rather than there's one continuing line of God's redemptive history in world history. 
and God has always been about the same things. It's a completely radical different way of seeing the word. But what brought forth America is seeing it as an unbroken tradition. But I want to share something that Rabbi Sachs said to give you some idea even about the law itself or what we call the law. Because a lot of times when we use this language, we're betraying the fact that we have an authoritarian view and don't even realize it, that we have already given ground to tyranny. Listen to what he says. There's no Hebrew word that means obedience. I just need to obey God. God just wants your obedience. There's no Hebrew word that means obedience. The closest equivalent, Shema, means not obedience, but rather hearing, listening, striving to understand, internalizing and responding indeed. The very tone and texture of Deuteronomy is directed not at blind obedience, but at the contrary. It is a sustained attempt to help people understand why it is that God wants them to behave in the way that he does, not for his sake, but theirs. This is all online, so you can reread this again. But these ideas are rich, aren't they? There's no Hebrew word for obedience. He wants us to hear. He wants us to understand. He wants us to know this is the way of life, and it's true. This is the word, the best word for Torah is instruction. And the best idea for the fear of the Lord, I think, if I'm I'm simplifying, is God, I know you're good. And I know you're faithful, and I know you are wise, and I know you are loving, and I know that what you share with us is the best way. I know it's the best way, and I want your way. I choose your way. I want to know your ways. I want to understand them. I want to live them. I want to be like you. Not to earn your approval, not to earn your love, but because I genuinely worship you and adore you, and magnify you, and glorify you, and Lord, you are the thing that my heart longs for, and I just see your goodness, and your beauty, and you you get in the picture, but you get the other side of that too, is we just need to obey God, hear and obey, it's robot language, robot language, we're not robots, so now, with that kind of foundation that I laid, I want to kind of think through this idea of, is America special, have, have a special place in redemption history? Because that's a pretty radically bold statement, isn't it? And it has to be st- stated with humility, with responsibility, with the fear of the Lord. And I'm going to, for time's sake, I'm just going to look at what I put here. And, try, and it's all the notes are online. Let's see if I can speed this up to get somewhere. So I remember reading through Paul in Romans, mostly chapter 11, where he's talking about Israel. And Israel has been, you know, removed because of unbelief. And the Gentiles have been grafted in. But he says, but their fall is not permanent. This is an interesting idea, isn't it? The Jews, because of unbelief, they were cut off. But their cutting off is not permanent, it says. And he says, but to provoke them to jealousy, the gospel has come to Gentiles. So the idea here is that the gospel coming to the Gentiles would have such an effect and be such a manifestation of what I read in Deuteronomy, God with a people, God with a nation, that Israel would say that is the, our God with them. That is our God with them. And Paul says, I even magnify my ministry to Gentiles for the hope of provoking my Jews to jealousy. Not sinful jealousy, but good jealousy. I want them to see God with the Gentiles and recognize this is our God and he's with them. Yeah, because he wanted to be with all people of always. That was always his plan. (laughs) Pretty exciting, isn't it? Fast forward to the Acts of the Apostles. 
the Jewish church has the Jewish culture and they hear about what's going on down in Antioch and they go down to check it out and they're, like, and they're spirit-filled believers, but they're like, ah, can't take it. What do you mean you can't take it? It doesn't look Jewish enough. And, and so they're like, we're not, sh they sincerely couldn't <coughs> take, understand, could this be from God? Could God be in this? But God knows what he's doing. And before that happened, he had already taken Peter to Cornelius' house. This, he kind of sets things up in advance because he knows what we're going to face. And while they're having a giant dispute, Peter reminds them of how he brought the gospel to the Gentiles in the first place. And then they had Paul talk about all the miracles they worked. And then James said, this is what scriptures have foretold. It's rebuilding the tabernacle of David. They're seeing in the Gentiles receiving the gospel and living out the gospel, the very prophecies of the Old Testament being fulfilled and the world being delivered from darkness and being brought back into being a home for the divine presence. Pretty neat, isn't it? And then they said, for Moses has had for many generations in every city those who have preached him with the implication, but nothing like this has ever happened. The gospel has the power to deliver the whole world from bondage. It has the power to break every form of tyranny and oppression. It has the power to transform everything. Isn't that exciting? And that was the first seed. It was like the mustard seed being sown. The gospel is going to the Gentiles. And Paul is seeing in that seed, Israel's coming home. Why? They're going to see God with the Gentiles. Well, I'm um, fast forward. In the 12th century, Maimonides said that Christianity has already taken the truths of De of Deuteronomy around the world. They're already seeing it. It's amazing. Rabbi Sachs says the same thing. But by the 12th century, he goes, uh, I'll read it. The whole world is already filled with the words of the Christian Messiah and the words of the commandments. And these words have spread to the farthest islands and among many unenlightened peoples. And they discuss these words and commandments of the Torah. They're seeing it. Then Rabbi Sachs, he said, the Reformation is the next great development of the fulfillment of prophecy. Oh, wait, that's how I wrote what he said. I, I, that was my note, never mind. The Reformation is the next great development in the fulfillment of prophecy. This was due to the fact that there was not one form, now this is sex, there was not one form of protest against the Roman Catholic Church in the 16th century, but two, one developed by Luther focused on Paul in the New Testament, the other developed by Calvin drew its inspiration from the Hebrew Bible, especially the book of Deuteronomy. That meant the Calvinist regions such as Geneva, Holland, Scotland, and England, as well as the pilgrim fathers of the United States developed strong civil societies who basic understanding of morality was identical with the book of Deuteronomy. Isn't that exciting? That Rabbi Sachs is seeing this. Paul was right. Maybe America is special in redemption history. Not special like because of the ethnicity of people, or whatever, geography. No, it's because God, well, let me go on. There's a book called The 5,000-Year Leap by Cleon Skusen. I have no idea if I'm pronouncing his name right, but all the notes are online. But his idea is a super unique idea. Now, you know, I'd love to sit, I wish I could sit and talk with him about something because I, I see what happened in Western civilization. But he basically said that the ideas that get, were brought forth from our Constitu Declaration and Constitution. It took about 100, he said, 180 years in America before that moment finally came. And he, and he understands that these ideas were not just native to American. It's part of this long Western tradition of having received the gospel 
wrestled with God's word and lived it out. But he titled his book The 5,000 Year Leap because he was saying like when, when, when the pilgrims first came to America, it was, they, they did agriculture like they had for thousands of years. They had the same types of struggles. He was like, the world had not changed much at all. But suddenly, at, within 200 years of the birth of America, the whole world has been radically transformed in ways that blow the imagination. From the automobile, from the airplane, to the rocket ship, to television and radio, to medicines and all kinds of things that have suddenly burst forth on the earth. He said, the world... It developed really slowly for a long time. Now, was it only the birth of America that did it? That's something to be debated, something that you, you can't prove it. But he's seeing a correlation. There, there's a unique coincidence that something about the birth of America as a nation coincides with this radical, life-transforming development. More people lifted out of poverty. Now, that idea has some credibility when you realize, he said, what America did. He said, these ideas had, that had been working through Western civilization and implemented in different ways at different levels, because he does mention that the original American seal that they discussed was going to have Anglo, two Anglo-Saxons on the front side and Israel going through the wilderness on the other, because they said these are the two places where they had rule of law. Or the people's law, and but that and they understood that Deuteronomy was, or, or the Old Testament was the foundation of this law that they were establishing. But the idea is that America intentionally built the nation on biblical law. Now they said natural law because they saw no difference between them. That bib that. Biblical law was given because sin caused man to forget what is self-evident in reality that is clear if they use reason unperverted by sin, right? And there's reasons for this, and maybe we'll get to discuss them right now or, or another day. But do you get the idea that for the first time in world history, a nation was birthed that made the values of Scripture a reality? And within 200 years, the world never looked... That does not look the same. And he said all these other nations responded and reacted to America. Isn't that interesting? And I'm not even halfway through my notes. But I do want to read this one for Alexis de Tocqueville. See, what I'm saying is so real and so profound that Alexis de Tocqueville came to America to find out the source of her greatness. And I've just read a whole bunch of quotes this week from Alexis de Tocqueville in it is so awesome, the heritage that we have in America. But I'm just going to read one. I sought for the greatness and genius of America in her commodious harbors and in her ample rivers, and it was not there. I sought for the greatness and genius of America in her fertile fields and boundless forests, and it was not there. I sought for the greatness and genius of America in her rich mines and her vast world commerce, and it was not there. I sought for the greatness and genius of America in her public school system and in her institutions of learning, and it was not there. I sought for the genius and greatness of America in her democratic Congress and her matchless constitution, and it was not there. Not until I went into the churches of America and heard her pulpits flame with righteousness did I understand the secret of her genius and power. America is great because America is good. If America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. Prophetic word. The soul of America. The soul of America that needs to be restored. I'm going to try to wrap this up in five minutes, hopefully, and, and prepare us for part two. But do you, is, doesn't that picture amaze you? I sought for the greatness of America. Where did I find it? I found it in her pulpits. I found it in her church. 
If we're going to restore the soul of America, we need to know what is at the heart of it. This idea is going to be challenging for many Christians, and we will unpack it more next week, or in two weeks. Because Pastor Mike will be preaching next week. We need to return to the faith that it made America great. Hmm. Ben, you all have heard of Benjamin Franklin, right? You know that people call him the least Christian founder, or maybe not the least, but they really harp on he was not a Christian, right? And you also often hear them talk about our founding fathers were deists, and we throw out all these derogatory terminology without really listening to them and giving them a chance to give their voice, to know who they really were. It shows you how far we've gotten from passing on to future generations, somewhere that line got broken. And these words, which I command you, shall teach them diligently to your children, lest you forget you were forced, you were slaves in the land of Egypt. We've forgotten who we are. We've lost our soul. We're not losing our soul. We have lost our soul. As a nation, we have lost it. And we have to come home. We need to return. We need to come home. And, and, the, and the church, when we don't know how to come home, and when we don't know the principles that birthed America, it, all it is is language with no substance. Does that make sense? That's the challenge that we're facing, that we have to go and dig and research and uncover the soul of America and find out who we were to know who we are and where we want to go. We need to recover the soul of America as believers. We have a moral obligation to our children to do so, to future generations, to posterity, to our neighbors, to unbelievers. We have a moral obligation for their blessing to remember who we are, to restore our soul. So I'll just wet the whistle on a few things here. Several of the founders have left us with descriptions of their basic religious beliefs. And the genius of this, but the challenge for Christians to swallow it is going to be hard, and we're not going to get into that today, but let's just listen to what he says. Benjamin Franklin summarized those which he felt were the fundamental points in all sound religion. This is the way he said in a letter to Ezra Stiles, president of Yale University. Here is my creed. I believe in one God, the creator of the universe, that he governs it by his providence, that he ought to be worshipped, that the most acceptable service we render to him is in doing good to his other children, that the soul of man is immortal and will be treated with justice in another life, respecting its conduct in this. These I take to be the fundamental points in all sound religion. And what we're going to discover, we're not going to do it today for time. They founded America on that truncated creed that they said all human beings can agree upon from all different religions for the most part because it gives us a basis for natural law or divine law however you want to call it, because that's the idea of natural law. It is divine law spoken into creation that when people actually walk according to it, creates human flourishing. And, the, and it's amazing. Our founders, Cicero, uh, many philosophers, they understood it. When you lose that we were created by God, it all is lost. When you lose we're created in the image of God, it is all lost. Interesting, isn't it? We're going to unpack these ideas. But these are the ideas that are at the soul of America. We've lost those ideas. They actually intentionally educated America. These are not idea creeds that belong to one denomination. And that's why it was hard for a lot of Christians to always swallow. 
is can are we doing dis, a disservice to God? Are we doing a disservice to God if we truncate it that much as our foundational center of our soul as a nation? But the reason why they did that is because it gave them a foundation from which to build the rest of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. That you shall be kind and tender hearted to one another. That you shall love the foreigner and stranger in your land that it, cre it creates a foundation for agreement for us to build a moral, virtuous people. If America ever ceases to be good, she will no longer be great. If America ceases to be good, she will never be great. We need to understand the soul of America, if we're going to restore it. That's one of the things that's just, I believe, on all of our hearts. But even understanding that if this idea is true, America is the first nation that really implemented a biblical social architecture in Gentile nations as a first fruits of what will one day provoke the Jews to jealousy. And that's why we're important in redemption history. We structured our nation on the fear of God. But we have lost it. We've lost our soul. No matter, you, there's no wall you can build in America that is going to save us from the rot that is happening in our culture and society because we've lost our soul. But the good news is it can be resurrected. It can be resurrected. We need to pray to that end, labor to that end, because it's not about us and our blessing and our prosperity. It's about the world knowing that he is good, and he is wise, and he is loving, and his instructions lead to human flourishing. It breaks tyranny and oppression, and it creates a world that's a home for the divine presence. It's not just us. In my own entertainment or leisure, as a matter of fact, it's part of having lost our soul. It's about the world needing God. We need to remember who we are and come home. Amen, amen.